Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, today um, for our discussion on a UK Latin American trade. Um, we, uh, when I first took this job, a friend of mine who's a journalist at the Financial Times wrote me and said, well, you're gonna get a front row seat on Brexit. Um, I've had a front row seat. I just didn't know the movie would be such a cliffhanger. Um, but apart from the actual day-to-day -day, uh, drama of how Brexit will occur, there's also that nuance. And as a political scientist, it's been exciting to me to be here and watch how the bureaucracy uh, sort of gears up uh, to address new challenges and also to beef up its own capacity to be able to engage on trade or on foreign relations. And at a micro level, this is a really an interesting time uh, to be in the UK as a political scientist. Uh, and we're, because of that, uh, we, about a year ago, a little less actually, we started a study, uh, Anar Bata and I, uh, on the implications of Brexit for uh, UK Latin American agricultural trade, which I'll talk about. Out of that grew the study which we're going to present in the latter half of uh, today's uh, discussion. But before we do, I wanted to introduce uh, Ranil Jayawadena, uh, who is the Minister uh, in the Department of International Trade, who's been kind enough to take some time out of his busy schedule today to talk a little bit about this topic, uh, UK Latin American trade, and what the Department of International Trade is doing precisely on this issue to increase its institutional presence, to increase its contacts, to increase information available to deepen uh, UK and Latin American trade. Um, Ranil was a, is a British Conservative Party politician. He's been a member of parliament uh, for the Northeast Hampshire district since uh, May, 2015. And he's been the, the Minister of International Trade since May, 2020. Uh, he'll say a few words. Uh, and then, as I say, we'll present a little bit about our re ongoing research and commented on by uh, Vanessa Rubio, uh, former uh, Deputy Se Undersecretary for Finance and Public Credit, for Social Development and also for Foreign Affairs, and by Christina, uh, who will talk about from the Department of International Trade, will talk a little bit about their reaction to uh, the study. So, Renil, please uh, take it away. Look forward to hearing your thoughts. Uh, well, thank you, Chris. Uh, great to be with you uh, all today. And uh, yes, indeed, my apologies that I have to dart away. Uh, this is a very busy time, as you say, uh, as we head towards the 31st of December. And today, more good news uh, out uh, from the DIT in respect of our continuity agreement with Mexico, uh, which is uh, very timely ahead of this call. And indeed, more broadly, my thanks to uh, Chatham House, of course, for producing this thoroughly useful report. Um, indeed, knowing who is listening to me today, uh, who collectively know a great deal more uh, about this subject than I do, um, I'm reminded uh, of the comment of uh, Oscar Wilde uh, when he first saw Niagara Falls. He, asked, he was asked um, uh, what he thought of it, and he said it'd be more interesting if it flowed the other way. And perhaps uh, we can rectify that in uh, the Q&A uh, after I've said a few brief words. Um, so I thought uh, perhaps I could bring, um, be begin today by briefing, uh, briefly outlining the uh, thoughts of the government on our goals for international trade, and then talk about some of our activities specifically in Latin America to achieve uh, those goals. As we look towards economic recovery in a world riven by trade wars and increased tariff and non-tariff barriers, um, we see the return of Britain's independent trade policy is very, very timely. As the Secretary of State, uh, Liz Truss, set out in her keynote speech at Chatham, uh, Chatham House uh, in October, uh, we intend to use uh, this opportunity uh, to champion a value-generating and values-driven trade policy that will see Britain lead the fight for free and fair trade and challenge those who won't play by the rules. And this government is passionately committed to the cause of free trade, which has lifted billions out of poverty around the world, led to a cleaner environment, and indeed put food on people's plates. It is uh, helping developing and developed countries alike. And that's why we have set ourselves the goal of having 80% of British trade uh, with countries covered by uh, free trade agreements within the next few years. And in Latin America, we are uh, in an excellent place, I think, um, British exports to LATAC countries uh, grew by over 6% uh, to £17.9 billion last year, doubtless a figure 
uh, impacted uh, by the pandemic, um, as we will soon see. But we have, uh, I believe, a very strong foundation to build on. There are new horizons of opportunity opening across the continent. Latin America is a growing market with a young population, diverse economies uh, and vast resources with a hunger for new technologies, high quality and world-class expertise for which Britain uh, is well known. And at the Department for uh, International Trade, uh, we have been working hard to seize that opportunity and that potential. Throughout 2020, we have led on putting in place these continuity agreements with Central America, a CARIB Forum, the Andean community in Chile, um, to ensure that uh, trade can continue to flow freely, regardless of their outcomes uh, with the European Union. Uh, we are working closely with our partners in Latin America, not merely, of course, to implement simply those agreements, but to remove additional market access barriers as well, which, as this report outlines, uh, really does hinder that bilateral trade and increases the cost of doing business unnecessarily. We are working to build the foundations of a more ambitious trade partnership there through government to government trade dialogues. Um, I was pleased to host one with Colombia uh, in July and Chile in October. And we are working to strengthen that trading relationship further with Mercosur markets. Uh, we uh, recently held the 11th uh, United Kingdom Brazil JETCO, um, which I uh, was part of, and uh, wh where we discussed, of course, a range of issues uh, such as improving market access, services, intellectual property, trade facilitation, and the business environment. And I'm looking forward um, very soon to speaking with other countries in the region, uh, for example, uh, the Vice Foreign Minister of Argentina soon, and to discuss um, next year's uh, commercial dialogue and um, indeed uh, to discuss uh, progress on a number of British interests. Uh, for example, the Scotch Whiskey Association's application for geographical indication, um, which is true uh, as an issue in Argentina and elsewhere, to press um, those sorts of very tangible benefits from trade, but indeed to think further and look towards our mutual interest in working towards a, a United Kingdom Mercosur free trade agreement. And we do, of course, continue to work um, towards our potential accession to uh, the CPTPP, uh, one of the world's largest free trade areas, uh, including many of the countries in uh, this region. And the Secretary of State has already shared uh, with CPP, uh, CPTPP members uh, her intention and the government's intention to submit that membership application early next year. Even without those agreements in place, we have enjoyed significant success, as I've said, in securing uh, market access wins for British businesses in Latin America. Uh, in total, uh, DIT has helped over 200 businesses secure nearly a billion dollars worth of business this year. And uh, we've secured those sorts of approvals um, across a range of uh, countries and sectors from fish uh, exports to Brazil to sheep genetic material in Argentina. And we're making progress on legal and tax issues to improve the incentives for investment in both directions, of course, striking double taxation agreements with Colombia and Uruguay, for example. And we are working to support the development of a more welcoming business environment generally in Latin uh, America. In Colombia, uh, Brazil and Mexico, for example, we are supporting the incorporation of building information modeling processes into their construction projects. This will reduce construction time, mitigate risks and improve performance. And on construction, we are partnering uh, with Peru to support the delivery of one of the country's largest reconstruction projects through our G2G agreement, which we signed back in June this year. And uh, this will allow British expertise to be uh, harnessed to build back better for the future in the region. We're supporting the adoption of uh, health technology assessment frameworks uh, throughout a number of markets in Latin America and the Caribbean. And we're also backing the growth of bilingual education in Brazil and vocational training in Mexico. In Panama, we've been offering uh, British expertise in the setting up of a new 
public-private partnership unit in the Ministry of Public Works. And the list goes on. Um, and these measures will in turn make investment and growth in uh, British businesses in LATAC markets uh, more attractive. But I must reflect on this and say that I don't see this as simply a matter of self-interest. Um, you know, British businesses producing high-end goods, cutting-edge professional services and green growth can actually help grow um, economies in the region, uh, in Latin America, and enable technological and environmental uh, change. And that's why uh, we are using our world-class expertise in green energy uh, in advance of Britain's presidency of COP26 next year to support the development of clean energy frameworks, uh, such as for offshore wind in Brazil. We also recognize that our financial services expertise, particularly in fintech, can play a key role in unlocking growth. So uh, the United Kingdom has been uh, supporting the development of new fintech regulations in Mexico uh, and uh, to develop uh, open banking standards in Mexico and Brazil. Um, and we've also uh, recently helped uh, Colombia explore this theme too. Uh, in recent years, um, the flow has also been true the other way. Uh, we have seen strong interest from LAC LATAC companies uh, to use um, Britain as a base for it growing their international business. And we, of course, warmly welcome this uh, from food to fintech, construction to creative industries. And these investments are great. Uh, we are a great platform from which uh, businesses can trade and thrive. And we will support these companies to grow and export from Britain, just like any other British business. We see trade and investment between Britain and LATAC as a win-win, and we will continue to back it. So, as I said at the outset, I didn't want to speak for too long. That's just my brief outline of the work that we have been doing to secure our trading future with uh, Latin America and the importance that we place on its potential. And if I may return to where we started as the transition period ends, it is by seizing these opportunities with emerging rapidly developing regions like Latin America that we will truly become uh, Global Britain, an unapologetic champion of free trade, fighting to bring down tariff and non-tariff barriers and creating new opportunities for British businesses uh, around the world. We will negotiate British-shaped trade deals suited to the strengths of our economy, which support our values and which can show what we can achieve as a newly independent nation. And those deals, those deals will be at the heart of this government's mission to level up, deliver opportunity and unleash the potential of every part of our United Kingdom. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, why don't we take some questions? We have about uh, 15 minutes. Um, you can use the raise your hand function at the bottom of your screen, and then I'll call on you and you can, act, you can ask the question uh, in person. Um, I should say that this is not under the Chatham House rule. So anything we say uh, can be publicly cited, it's public. Uh, uh, the minister knew that when he started. I don't think I'm springing anything on him, uh, but I wanna make it clear to also those who ask questions. And I'm gonna take advantage uh, of the, this lag here just to ask the question I have, which you, know, you, you mentioned Mexico. Can we expect some good news soon on Mexico, Minister? Uh, absolutely. Today we have agreed our continuity agreement uh, with Mexico. It has been signed, uh, and I'm delighted uh, that is the case. Um, this is uh, an important relationship uh, in the region for all sorts of industries, for example, from automotive to food and drink, as we've already covered. Uh, this will protect our existing trade flows under the exi existing terms, but more importantly, we have also committed on both sides that we will ne uh, negotiate a new, fuller, uh, British-shaped uh, trade deal uh, next year. We will uh, kick off those negotiations and deliver it, I hope, in short order, um, because there is so much more potential uh, than is uh, in the agreement that uh, Mexico already has with the EU. And working as Britain uh, alone, uh, we are more agile as one than as one of 28. So we can really use that agility to good effect um, for us and for our partners. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So we have a question. I will call on you. And if you want to, you can open up your, unmute yourself or you can be unmuted and ask a question in person. 
So Alex Trott has a question. Alex, I can read it for you, but why don't you speak up if you can, and if you can introduce yourself. Hi, my name is uh, Alex Trott um, from Shell. Uh, just curious, is there uh, any possibilities of a UK-Brazil FTA anytime soon, uh, you know, in the next year? Um, so Brazil, of course, um, is covered by Mercosur. So it would be um, a relationship between Britain and Mercosur. I would observe that the EU uh, has negotiated an, uh, an agreement with uh, Mercosur, but has not yet uh, found its way to agree uh, such uh, a deal. So there is, of course, the potential for us to uh, go further. Um, I'm certainly having conversations with my counterparts, and there is a real commitment on both sides uh, to deepen those relationships, uh, find that roadmap towards an FTA. Um, but uh, at this moment in time, I can't give you a time scale on it. Thank you. Uh, Enrique Hernandez also had a question, but it was preempted a bit by Alex's, but uh, in your answer, Minister. But Enrique, do you want to, uh, I don't want to preempt your question. Do you want to ask another one? No, thank you, thank you very much. The, the question was, uh, if you, if the minister expect some kind of agreement with the Mercosur countries, uh, taking into account that the uh, EU is uh, negotiating uh, a treaty uh, between both parties, and perhaps you legislate in the future. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for that question. And I mean, um, look, Mercosur, as, as, as I've said, we are uh, having those conversations already uh, with our friends to see how we can deepen that trade relationship. Um, it is a very significant trading block uh, within the region, um, and it's certainly a priority relationship. Uh, I know that uh, we've had, as I say, the uh, United Kingdom Brazil JETCO, uh, where uh, looking at how we can harness the power of uh, United Kingdom's agility and Mercosur's aspiration and ambition um, can lead us down this road uh, towards a future FTA. Um, but uh, we aren't uh, able at this moment in time to give a precise time scale, as I said. Um, but perhaps it would be helpful to say that we have agreed that we will uh, really uh, identify that roadmap over the next six months so that we will know where we are going and how fast we are going there um, uh, in, in pretty short order. Uh, I hope that that is helpful. And I, I would just make one, one observation, if I may. You know, the EU has, as, as you say, um, negotiated an agreement with Mercosur. But the question is, Will the EU be able to bring that agreement into effect? And at this moment in time, it isn't clear whether that will be the case. Um, and uh, it could be that Britain's agility uh, as an independent trading nation means that we can go more swiftly um, at that uh, agenda and uh, arrive at the prize sooner than the EU can. But uh, who knows? Uh, watch this space. Thank you very much. Uh, Amir Ladoui uh, has a question. Amir, please. Hi. Uh, hello, everybody. Yeah, Amir from the Latin American Center at the, at the London School of Economics. My question was, uh, could you discuss the potential trade and investment opportunities between the UK and Latin America in the renewable energy, low carbon technology yeah. sector? Um, well, thanks for that. I mean, uh, I, I, I won't confess. Uh, I, I, I will admit, I, I, I must confess, I, I won't pretend to be an expert on absolutely every sector. Uh, and I, as I said at the outset, uh, you guys know uh, a lot more than I, um, than I certainly uh, would uh, ever suggest uh, I do today. Um, I think there are significant opportunities around the world, um, frankly, to secure wins for the green economy. And we have been very clear from a British perspective that we want to fund uh, a significant amount uh, through UK Export Finance, which is our um, credit guarantee agency, and to make sure that where there is market failure, but where there are viable projects that should go ahead, then the UK government is stepping in to provide that, uh, that finance, those financial instruments that are necessary. Um, but I do think there are significant opportunities. Um, we have indeed discussed this with our partners, um, including in the JETCO uh, most recently. Um, and indeed, 
you know, I, I think it's really important to be absolutely straight up and say that we do, of course, um, believe that is our trade and our friendships, which mean we can also have tough conversations uh, about the environment uh, where there are uh, issues that need to be uh, need to be raised, and we do indeed uh, raise them. So I think what you will see in the uh, the months and years ahead, now that we have taken that decision, uh, which was taken literally two days ago, um, but has been the result of a, a much work uh, internally to get us into the right place. Um, I think you will see uh, that uh, that funding uh, and that commitment really shining through, um, enabling a number of projects to happen, for example, offshore wind, uh, where, which we've already had a number of conversations about. Great. We have three more questions. I'm going to take those all in a bundle, and then uh, Renew will let you speak, and then if you have any final reflections, you can wrap up at that point as well. So uh, we'll start off with Chris Horseman. Uh, Chris, do you want to... Uh, what was your question? Uh, yes, um, Minister, I wondered if you could say something a bit more about the um, uh, the UK-Mexico agreement, which was announced this afternoon, uh, and in particular, whether it's based on the, um, the, the, the agreement, which is currently in force, dating from, uh, I think, 2000, or whether you've been able to steal a march on, on the EU and actually incorporate bits of the new EU agreement, which has not yet been ratified, but which the two sides signed off about 18 months ago. Great. Why don't we go to Baroness Hooper, uh, who has a question as well. Gloria? Hello. Thank you. Um, as uh, one of the Prime Minister's um, a newly appointed trade envoys to Costa Rica, Panama, and the Dominican Republic, I'm naturally very happy that uh, one of the first continuity agreements uh, we signed up to uh, was uh, with Central America. Uh, but my question is actually about tourism, uh, because uh, the, these three countries um, uh, depend very much on tourism, and um, tourism is a two-way process, because most of the travel agents uh, 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 who are based in the UK are uh, arranging bespoke holidays and eco-tourism uh, um, adventures uh, and, and so on um, are, are very interested in having um, a little more recognition of the fact uh, that th at the other end, um, the conditions are in some cases better than they are here uh, in terms of the dreaded COVID. Uh, and obviously the whole thing is affected by that. Uh, but when um, can we expect uh, that perhaps a more realistic approach can be made um, to uh, uh, allowing tourism and travel and the advice from the government um, uh, on this um, to, to emerge. Thank you very much, Baroness. And of course, countries that are, rely on tourism are, have been very hard hit with COVID. Uh, Jose Pujana, uh, you have a question. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Minister. Um, my question is rather general, but, but I think it's important. What sort of actions could we take along with um, DIT, Chatham House, other partners um, to close even more the perception gaps that some businesses still have in the UK in regards to Latin America, not just in regards to, to, to language barriers or, or distance, but other aspects such as ease of doing business. I think there's there's still a lot that we can do to attract them to consider Colombia, not just Colombia, sorry, but Latin America in general as um as an investment destination or as a, or as a business partner. Thank you very much. So, Minister, three questions. One is uh, the Mexico agreement. What is it? Is it just a rollover of the EU? Did you, I like the phrase, steal a step on the EU in negotiating more of a bilateral agreement? Uh, Baroness Hooper's question about tourism in Central America and what are next steps? And then last, uh, Jose's question uh, about, you know, what can we do? And, I, and that's very much sort of the, the, the notion of this study that we'll be talking about in a little while is what can Chatham House and the DIT and, and Latin American investors and governments do? Take it away, sir. So uh, look, thanks for those questions. Uh, Chris, um, in terms of the, the deal, um, well, this is based on the uh, existing deal, the uh, uh, global agreement and uh, not the uh, modernized uh, agreement. And that's uh, per our continuity mandate. We can't uh, of course, transition agreement that's not yet in force, and the uh, modernized agreement between the EU and Mexico 
is not expected to be in force until sometime in 2021. Um, so, so that's why we have used the global agreement. Um, but more importantly, uh, we have agreed with Mexico to start those bilateral negotiations next year, which um, at a minimum, as far as I'm concerned, will reach the same level of ambition as the modernized EU-Mexico agreement. But I think we can go even further on specific sectors of interest of both sides. And as I say, it's using that agility that we have as one rather than as one of 28 as was um, to really make sure that the deal works for us. And you know, I think there are a number of areas where we've demonstrated that, say with Japan, where we have gone further already uh, on data and digital, for example. Um, so I hope that that is uh, a helpful and clear answer. Um, but you know, the key thing for us was to secure that continuity right now um, because trade between Britain and Mexico is worth 5.3 billion pounds, or it was last year anyway, uh, the most recent figures we have, around 4,000 businesses uh, rely on uh, that, uh, that access. Um, and so this continuity deal secures that, but also paves the way for us to start negotiating that more ambitious uh, FTA in 2021. Um, in terms of Gloria's question, um, uh, good, good, good to hear uh, you and uh, hear your voice uh, today. Uh, it's, uh, it's a shame we uh, aren't seeing so much of each other in the CPA and uh, IPU rooms as we might do, uh, might have done in the past, but uh, um, such is the world that we live in uh, right now. And on tourism, I mean, I think you will have seen um, some of the move towards a test to release uh, and so on, uh, which we have been trying to uh, develop in order that uh, we can get into a better place in terms of travel. Um, no one pretends that this time has been easy, whether that is for tourism, for leisure, travel, or indeed for business travel. Um, but um, through these sorts of innovations, uh, we hope that we will be able to uh, get out of this situation sooner rather than later. Of course, uh, the vaccine is a great, uh, uh, a great boost to our morale and indeed uh, to the uh, ambitions we might have for 2021. Uh, in enabling not only tourism, but also uh, business travel. And uh, uh, certainly I think you'll see more uh, coming out of government on that because we recognize the importance um, of, of travel to our economies, um, both ways, uh, of course. Um, but it is clear that this is a challenge that uh, isn't going away uh, immediately. It won't be uh, uh, going away this winter and we still have to do what we can to struggle through the best we possibly can um, and indeed use uh, these technologies to see us through until then, which I know doesn't bode terribly well for leisure travel, but uh, at least means we can keep business uh, ticking over. And then, uh, Jose, uh, thanks for your question on um, uh, the misconceptions of uh, Latin America and the UK, and uh, I agree with you. I think there have been lots of misconceptions and generalizations about Latin America in the past and uh, uh, in Britain. And that's one of the things that we have been trying very hard to dispel, uh, to address. And we've been very active at organizing uh, an annual LATAC roadshow in Britain uh, to demystify uh, the, the continent, uh, to demystify the region. Uh, and our trade commissioner has been very adamant about this. And, uh, um, indeed, a great advocate for uh, the region. So um, we we do believe we have seen the perception uh, in Britain of Latin America change, um, and um, you know uh, we, we will of course redouble our efforts on that, and vice versa. Um, you know I think we've seen um, the perception of Britain change in the region. Um, I think that the region is now much more aware of how innovative we are uh, and the potential that we hold. Um, for um, partnership in key sectors such as tech, such as creative, uh, such as green, uh, the green economy, and indeed uh, life sciences. And there's still a, a long road ahead on both sides, um, but I believe we are equipped uh, to, uh, to tread that path together uh, and be ever more effective and impactful uh, on achieving our shared goals. And of course, I believe that there is a, a political will on both sides, as well as the business uh, intent, uh, which means that I, I do believe that we are all aligned and there is a unique opportunity 
in this this parliament here in these next few years to really make a real difference. Thank you very much, Minister. That was delightful. And, and uh, in a pretty dark time, I think, uh, globally, uh, you've given a little bit of hope with today with the uh, both generally on UK interest and your commitment and passion to deepening those trade ties, I think is, is very inspiring. And you came bringing good news, uh, the UK and Mexico trade deal. So that's always welcome, although we're willing to take the bad news as well. But uh, good news is at a premium right now. So thank you very, very much for your time. I know you need to go. Uh, and really appreciate it. And we hope we can continue to collaborate with you uh, on this topic and others. So thank you very much, Minister. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye-bye. Okay, so now I have the difficult task of presenting when I'm also the chair. I'm unshackled by any checks and balances uh, on myself, but I'm going to try to stick to the limited time because we wanna have two commentators. Uh, the first, as I mentioned, Vanessa Rubio, undersecretary uh, for a whole number of institutions uh, uh, departments and ministries in, in Mexico, uh, including uh, finance and public credit, and Christina Irving Turner, who is the uh, Caribbean Latin American business specialist at DIT. So as I mentioned, uh, what I'll do is just quickly present a pricey of our ongoing research project. Uh, and it's based on a series of surveys we conducted with Latin American businesses and UK businesses, as well as commercial attaches from both sides of the Atlantic. Um, in 1999, the former Chatham House director, Victor Bulmer Thomas, wrote in a book uh, that uh, the British, UK, Latin American trade uh, after 1970s was underperforming. And the same can be said very much today. The question is why? Because in fact, both sides have very distinct comparative advantages. Just to take two of the, I think, five or six examples we cite in the study, for example, in, in 2019, 73% of all UK agricultural imports came from the EU. Um, and obviously the question is, is why? I mean, uh, under CAP and other provisions under the EU, those are allowed for, but will Brexit allow for a greater opening of that market for Latin America? And right now, as it currently exists, uh, clearly Latin American agricultural producers, in particular Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay in areas such as soy, beef, chicken, dairy products are underperforming. Uh, just to take Brazil and Argentina, they only counted for in 2018, 1.6% of the UK's agricultural market. And to give you an idea of the potential here, Uruguay, which is a country of 3.49 million people, produces 10 times what it needs it can consume itself. And within a few years will likely produce enough food to sustain 50 million people. So surplus and comparative advantages do exist. And the argument among many farmers and exporters in those Southern Cone countries is that they are prepared and ready to meet a lot of the UK phytosanitary standards, but simply haven't had the market access and the opportunity to be able to export. A second, if you look at the other area, uh, is on the UK side. Uh, there are obvious comparative advantages for the UK, whether in research and development, manufacturing, financial services, FinTech, as the minister mentioned, and indeed, if you look again, and we do in the report, at these uh, comparative advantages in, in the UK's performance, just to take one example, in 2012, the latest data that we have available, the UK only exported six, $60 million uh, dollars worth of insurance service related to Brazil. Okay? That is only represented 0.5% of the UK's exports globally in insurance and insurance services making Brazil, which is the ninth largest economy in the world, 14th in terms of British uh, exports in, in insurance services globally. So obviously it's underperforming. Uh, and the same is true if you look across FinTech, if you look across on services and goods consistently, whether it's Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, Mexico, um, you see consistently that those countries underperform as export markets to the UK relative to their weight in the global markets. The question, of course, then is, is why? And that is precisely why we um, uh, conducted this survey. And several points came out. The first is the lack of contacts and relationships between businesses and trade associations consistently responded, cited those as being one of the greatest hindrance factors for their ability to recognize and understand trade and investment opportunities and to consolidate those. A second is insufficient information on regulation and local business culture. 
simply it goes to the point beyond just issues of context is the issue of sort of regularized information that can help increase their interest and help them navigate the investment conditions in those countries. A third is something the minister mentioned and Jose also mentioned, the misperceptions and the negative generalizations of Latin America uh, in the UK. Well, of course, it's not unique to the UK. It's also true in the United States. And the last is the UK's traditional focus on other emerging economies, especially in the Near East and Asia. In other words, it hasn't simply looked across the Atlantic. But of course, this is important, not just because the UK is leaving the, the EU, but also because the US is declining uh, economic presence in the region and China's rising uh, influence in the region, which is becoming more and more a geopolitical issue that the US has raised consistently as a challenge to its primacy, but also the primacy of more democratically and human rights oriented uh, states in the world. Question is, is can the UK begin to serve uh, those issues? Um, and those goals. So what precisely were some of the uh, uh, challenges? According to our surveys, one was that the UK simply hasn't in the past differentiated itself from the EU. While other countries and investors say from Germany and France were very active on the ground for a long time and have been able to invest in areas obviously like automobiles, uh, manufactured products and construction, the UK has been slow on the uptake on those. On the Latin American side, uh, many uh, Latin American gov uh, government officials, as well as businesses, talked about the lack of knowledge of targeted market and opportunities in the UK, the lack of information about local products, the lack of trade missions in both directions, the uh, lack of clarity over phytosanitary standards that have been set by the EU and that are now being renegotiated, and the welter of mandatory quality and sustainability and trade certifications for different UK sectors was cited as a num by a number of the respondents as one, one of the challenges. And the last is competition from other markets, particularly Asia. As one of the respondents said, when the UK looks to other partners for its trade and investment relations, it looks, looks elsewhere. And actually, one of the surprising results of this survey was the issue of Brexit. We expected Brexit to be seen as an opportunity for many of the investors and traders in Latin America. In fact, it was quite the opposite. For most of the Latin American investors and business leaders, the challenge is actually understanding what's happening with Brexit. The lack of uncertainty, the lack of certainty, the unpredictability of standards and trade agreements has left a number of investors and commercial, um, commercially oriented exporters, uh, if you will, uh, out of the loop. And they're very interested to know how this happens. So what are the recommendations? I'm summarizing a very complex report here but I'll quickly go to the recommendations. The first is the need to increase knowledge sharing to close the perception gaps. And this was mentioned repeatedly in all of the surveys, uh, responses that we received. Specific suggestions include um, educating prospective exporters to UK on, export, on UK's export procedures and a proper education of the evaluation of risks, information sharing on the UK's legal and tax system were all important uh, and raised by all of the respondents. A second is investing in trade missions. Now, obviously this is difficult under COVID and this is coming right in the midst of COVID, but it could help foster relations and increase knowledge sharing among British and Latin American markets and consumers. And efforts could be made to develop relationships with key organizations like the British Chamber of Commerce, British Retail Consortium and others. One respondent even mentioned the need for to have some sort of collective Latin American chamber uh, that could speak and serve as a facilitator. And it's very similar to what is done, uh, for example, in South Asia. Another is the need to establish more opportunities for transatlantic dialogue to bring, to get, bring down tariff and non-tariff barriers. Another is improving the quality and uh, predictability of tax policy in Latin America, as well as adopting streamlined custom procedures in Latin America to increase trade and investment opportunities. Uh, another is increasing educational exchanges. And this has been mentioned by Baroness Hooper in other contexts, um, taking advantage of uh, higher education institutes and opportunities in the UK and also in Latin America to foster personal, educational, and eventually commercial relations. And the last is providing Latin American commercial attaches and producers with information on the detailed negotiations and standards that are emerging from Brexit. Going to my last point earlier, the Brexit is creating a level of uncertainty to the extent that the UK can provide uh, Latin American investors and governments with a window on what is happening and what is expected, that will serve as uh, an opportunity to be able to tear down many of these barriers that the minister 
talked about in misperceptions and the uncertainty that is acting as a hindrance. Um, that, for now, is where we are on this. As I say, this is an ongoing project. It's funded by the uh, Andean Development Bank. It's also made possible by the Latin American Initiative funders, uh, BTG Pactual, Fresneo, Diageo, um, Equinor, uh, Karen Energy, and Wintershell DEA, and HSBC. Uh, but we will continue and we hope to have a full report uh, later next year, but we wanted to take advantage of this time of the minister's time. So let me turn it over to uh, our two discussants in this. And let me start with uh, Vanessa. Let's talk from uh, the, the country of the moment now in London uh, is Mexico. And so Vanessa, give me your thoughts uh, on what the, the report and your general experience. You've, you've negotiated, you're, you're active in the negotiations of the Pacific Alliance. Your thoughts about trade deals and the potential between UK, uh, uh, Mexico trade. And by the way, she wears two hats now, uh, one in Mexico and she's now based in London at, at the London School of Economics. So she has a very good perspective on precisely this issue. Please, Vanessa. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, I think it's a very timely uh, study, a very timely report. Uh, and I think it's timely because we're looking at the actors saying we want to give a boost to the bilateral relationship between the UK and Latin America. Uh, I think a lot is, is going on in terms of, of, of the context. You have the recession vis-a-vis -vis the recovery. How does that play out in the UK? How does that play out in Latin America? You have obviously the Brexit. You have a USMCA just recently uh, um, put in place, you have the CPTPP that the minister referred to, you have the Pacific Alliance, you have the possibility of an agreement with Mercosur uh, from the UK, you have the new US uh, trade policy that will play a role in Latin America, definitely. And uh, very importantly, I think you have new economic uh, trade investment and financial policies in Latin America. So the ecosystem in Latin America has also changed. Um, I remember when, when you were referring to, to my participation uh, in the negotiations of the Pacific Alliance. Yes, I was a, a, a part of that. We finalized the, the negotiations, we signed the agreement, but we also afterwards uh, got together with Mercosur, for example, in our first meeting in, in, in Colombia, in Cartagena de Indias. It was a very difficult dialogue back then because you had a very closed Mercosur that uh, doesn't have, that didn't have back then the incentives to open up to the world, to uh, look into uh, further, uh, you know, possibilities of, of free trade with other countries in Latin America, but now has completely changed. And the Pacific Alliance has its own uh, internal uh, challenges as well. So I think it's time for a reboot and this, and this document presents that. Um, on, on, regarding the conclusions of the of the um, of the or the preliminary conclusions of the report, it doesn't strike me that again it's information, knowledge, contact, relationships, perceptions, misperceptions, uh, because they have been there and we haven't been able we have been able to to set out or lay out the stepping stones, but we need to move forward and that's why I think it's very important that you chose three topics to focus on to prioritize one being agriculture, the second one being financial services, and the third one being technology. I think that, that now is the moment to be more strategic, to, to focus on specific areas in which we can have more value added, in which we can go even beyond trade. The minister spoke about the possibility of having a, a, a new trade agreement being negotiated next year with Mexico, but we have to see new areas of trade. For example, the USMCA vis-a-vis uh, the previous agreement didn't have financial services back then in the 1990s. Now it has financial services. Now it has gender. Now it has climate. Now it has, you know, the next level of, of finance for, for, uh, for controversies, um, uh, trilateral controversies of trade. So I think that's the kind of ideas we need to be putting on the table, how to move forward, where to move forward, where to put specific focus and specific priorities and, and uh, I am really glad that we had the news of the, the continuation agreement between Mexico and, and the UK. Actually, the minister spoke about 17 billion pounds being the, the trade between uh, the UK and Latin America. Well, one third is Mexico. So I'm, I'm glad that that uh, came out well. And I think I'll leave my, my comments uh, on this regard uh, here for the moment. Again, a very positive uh, assessment. Thank you, uh, Vanessa. And I wanna say before I introduce uh, Christina Irving Turner, 
that this is, you know, this report is not intended as a criticism at all of BIT. It, it, what it doesn't capture is the longitudinal increase in trade that we're seeing just in the last couple of years. These are static snapshots uh, and intended to help. So, Christina, I know you've, you folks have been doing a lot on this. As I said earlier in my opening remarks, please, your thoughts on, on this report and what what's, comes next for all of you. Yes, thank you, Chris. And um, I'd like to thank Chatham House, you, Dr. Sabatini and CAF and our sponsors for funding and compiling the report. And of course, thank my other fellow speakers, Mi uh, Minister Gerard Denner and Vanessa as well. I think from the outset, what you talk about with the report, it's important to recognise what more can be done and needs to be done. We're not going to improve, move forward, as Vanessa was saying, and take the UK's market share in trade with LATAC and enable that to grow. I think on the practical side, I'd really like to highlight some, some points. We have 130 staff, a great network on the ground in 19 markets across Latin, across Latin America and the Caribbean. And a real enhanced element of our work, and we've seen it today, is on trade policy and, and really cracking the trade continuity. And this important piece of work and unlocking the barriers that really the only government to government work can can do, such as with uh, the minister mentioned the DTAs in Colombia, Colombia and Uruguay, but they also exist in Argentina, Panama, Chile, Jamaica, Barbados, Bolivia and Mexico, you know, across across the continent. The report doesn't recognise as well everything that's been invested in unlocking these barriers and working collaborative with regulatory authorities to ease trading environment for UK businesses. Some examples are with NICE, the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, which has been an initiative across Latin America. And FinTech's been mentioned, and we've been sharing a lot of best practice in Mexico, and I'm glad that Vanessa's here to talk about this, which is the second largest market for FinTech in Latin America and the Caribbean. And between 2019 and 2018 alone, there's been an increase of goods and services to LATAC by 6.1% and which UK companies are continuing to benefit from even in really challenging times. And I think that we've talked a lot about services and I think it's really important that we use this moment to really use the opportunity and the possibilities that the UK has to grow for services in LATAC. And the pandemic in, has shown the need for digital transformation. And whilst there are issues with connectivity in LATAC, according to the GSMA, LATAC has the highest global average of mobile users, smartphone adoption and subscriber penetration, making it a ripe market for the developed and sophisticated UK digital ecosystem. And coupled this, so the appetite, the consumer and a young consumer appetite, which has been mentioned, is there as well. This is coupled with the mega cities in LATAC, such as Sao Paulo, Mexico City, with populations of circa 21 million each, in themselves making them great for product distribution for our goods concentration of talent, but also centres for, for, for business, as well as being dynamic, modern, exciting places to do business, which leads me to one of the findings from the report, which is not new to any of us here, and that is about the issue of perception. So on a personal note, I think this is the million dollar question. Jose talked about it, Chris, you've talked about it, Vanessa's talked about it, and I've been in this position for almost a year and working in and around Latin America for around 10 years, and it's it's an obstacle that I think with persistence, we're just get, we, we have to keep going through. And it's something that we've been working on across our region. Um, as, minister, as the minister mentioned, it's been an ingrained commitment to our trade commissioners that are dedicated to tackling this. My role as business specialist is fun, fundamentally driven about dro driving trade promotion and aiming to centralize that and be visible. We have two new trade envoys, one of them Baroness Hooper on the line here and Darren Henry MP who is representing the Commonwealth Caribbean countries. And we're going into our third iteration of the LATAC Roadshow, which this year will be digital and looking at sectors and developing and evolving in new ways with a real remit of bringing new, bus new UK businesses to trading with, with LATAC. I think British companies previously, we need to remember this, may have been you know, unsure about China and India, and now they are the go-to markets. Yet India is ranked lower in ease of doing business than Chile, and Mexico. And this is just one prime example that we have to, that we have to, Indonesia, South Africa also, when we talked about, but using those, because we've mentioned in your report about the, uh, about the, about Asia. And I think this is just talking about, we have to have that sustained effort and be tenacious and embrace the Latin in us to be flexible and are working together and collaboratively to overcome these perceptions. And although the percentage of trade is modest, I'd like to really look under those numbers and get underneath that. DIT has supported over 4,000 UK companies 
into LATAC. And conversely, companies such as Alpec, a Mexican company, in 2020, a challenging year, have invested in the UK creating jobs. And underpinning all of this, the UK government has been using trade as a means to generate future prosperity, sustainable growth. So offshore wind projects in Brazil, prosperity fund projects in Agritech, which is a, an area that we discussed in, 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 in Colombia in your report as well, and driving towards mutually recognized qualifica educational qualifications, Chile, Argentina, Mexico, and Colum Colombia. So I think persistence and progress and using Vanessa's kind of working towards are both words that I would use to describe kind of our trading relationship and our reaction to this uh, to this report, both of which characteristics I believe any business in any global market needs for, for, uh, for success and qualities that we at DIT really strive to embody at a working level and then really share that for the benefit for UK and LATAC trade. Thank you very much. I have a number of questions myself, but I'm going to open it up uh, for if there are any other questions. We have about six minutes left. Uh, please follow the same uh, format as before. You can hit the raise your hand or ask a question. Uh, there are, I don't see any now, but let me go ahead then, Christina, and ask, what do you attribute the successes to? Um, you know, one of the things that we discovered was in the case of Peru, the UK construction company has really got a leg up because of the construction of the dormitories and the infrastructure for the Pan, Pan American Games. What would you, you know, the, 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 what you say, what you cited as the, the cases of investment, to what do you attribute those? Um, I think there are lots, lots, lots of different things. You know, the fact that we have real British quality and expertise, that the UK is recognised as, as, as a strong brand, and, is that, and the fact that the, for Peru, the, for the Pan American Games, what was wanted was that Rolls Royce treatment, you know, and the quality and, the, and we could we could do that. We can also give people other elements, but we can give the range. And I think for the UK, we were able to do that. We were able to deliver on time, transparently, with, uh, to budget, all the qualities and excellence that we're able to share and done that in a collaborative way with Peru. And I think that that's something that we were then able to build on. Businesses, again, that success, I think, are ones that are able to invest in resource. And I don't just mean money, but I mean time and people and the relationships that it takes. And once those relationships are built, then this is this is anecdotal, but that people do find that they do become strong customers because those professional relationships and loyalties are fundamentally there. But it takes time and it's not every business has the ability to be able to do that. But I think being reliable, being a partner that has quality, being a partner that's working towards the mutual best interests and wants to work together is something that the UK can really bring and something that often LATAC businesses will, will really value as well. Thank you very much. Um, the, uh, before we, we have one question from Baroness Hooper, but Vanessa, do you have any comments on sort of what you saw as those sorts of personal relationships that really could be leveraged for long-term investments and commitments and commerce? Yes, definitely. I, and I agree with what Christina is commenting on. I think those stepping stones that I was referring to sometimes take long to, to evolve and to mature and to, to imply actual businesses, but they, they do that over time. Uh, just in the case of Mexico, if you see those stepping stones, for example, and you, you make a, a, a cut in 2010, uh, in, in 2010, we had a, a trade uh, uh, between Mexico and the UK of 2.8 uh, billion pounds. Well, currently we have one almost double that, no? So it's 5.3 uh, billion pounds with B. Uh, so, um, so obviously you can you can do that by by having political will, as the minister uh, um, just mentioned it. I think that is very po important political will but then also creating the, the context for business to, to take place and for business to, to thrive and flourish. And I would also add to what Christina said uh, in relation to, to, to the e economic systems in Latin America, they have also been evolving a lot. If you would see Mexico 20 years ago, you would see that our trade balance would be 30% uh, 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 manufacturers and 70% you know, basic products. And now it's exactly the other way around. It's almost 80% manufacturing our exports. And, and, and following up to what the Baroness mentioned earlier in terms of, of, um, of tourism, I think that will play a very important role. And we will see that, for example, in, in, our, in our trade balance with the UK and with the rest of the world for next year. 
76% of our exports to the UK in terms of services are tourism services. Wow. So that is a sector that uh, really uh, countries in Latin America need to, to you know, get moving forward and find alternatives, uh, 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 digital alternatives to, to create uh, new markets uh, because and, and financial sector in support of these activities for the future, because it's a sector that is going to be particularly hit due to, to this current crisis. Thank you. Very, very nice granular assessment. Uh, Baroness Hooper, please. Thank you. And, and it's really good to hear this positive approach and the enthusiasm um, and good news stories um, this afternoon. And thank you, Chris, for um, making one of the recommendations of your report uh, a, a, a focus on the education sector, uh, which I continue to think is of the utmost importance. Uh, if I may, I'd just like to say that historically, of course, uh, the UK did trade and invest uh, very strongly uh, with Latin American countries, um, and there is still a huge amount of goodwill. Um, so, and, and still, many of our major companies, um, I see, well, I see, I. <laughs> but uh, but GSK and and and, and many others uh, are, are still still have a presence um, there. Um, but I think damage was done um, when the um, British banks all withdrew from Latin America, um, and that uh, for small and medium sized enterprises in particular who want to do business there, it's very reassuring if they uh, see a familiar bank uh, uh, at the other end. Um, that was one thing. It was also a mistake to, um, when the political decision was made to concentrate on China, uh, that embassies were closed in Latin America. Some, most of them uh, have been reopened happily, uh, but the British Council uh, and other organizations uh, were closed down. Um, um, and I also think, I'm, I, I'm hoping, I hope I'm not introducing a negative thing, but I think there are perceptions of um, violence and corruptions, corruption, uh, which linger on. Uh, uh, but I'm glad to hear that the good news suggests that, that that's being discounted. But that is because we only hear the bad news in from the media here. I, I don't know what we can do about that. Um, but I, frankly, I, I listen to Al Jazeera uh, news now because that's the <laughs> best program for conveying um, news about Latin America. Uh, and uh, if it, unless it's, it's bad news. Um, but uh, in order to change some of these perceptions, I think we need to somehow promote far more good news stories. And hopefully this report will enable us to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Baroness Hooper. That, you know, that's not a negative note. I think it's just a, an honest reflection of the challenge we have. And we need to be honest about uh, the source of that and what we need to do to address it. Uh, and uh, I very much appreciate that. Um, and it, you know, it's not just the UK uh, media that's guilty. The United States too, I've often said, has a bipolar relationship with Latin America. Either it's doing really well or it's, it's not, or it's just it, it, it taking a nosedive and it doesn't have a balanced approach. And we'll, we're working on this, I guess, is we, the best we can say. Christina, do you wanna offer some final remarks to, to uh, Baroness Hooper's comments? Yes, and indeed uh, at DIT, one of the things that we're really looking at is working with sector press so not and kind of where people go for in their industries for news and so not necessarily just the mainstream media and I think we now have more options than ever before with newsletters blogs um, industry conferences industry events so I think it's not necessarily just the mainstream media but also the sector press and that's something that we're really working towards so we've had um, some successes with, with, with obviously we've mentioned the Peru government's government initiative um, around the construction press. We want to do more to think about EPC companies, for, for example. What more can we do in the future with Agri to take um, that forward? So I think, you know, not necessarily look, not just the mainstream, but the sector press as well, I think is a, is a key way for us to influence and, and, and take that forward. And what's great about the sector press, it's peer to peer. It's not government saying that it's done or journalists saying it's done. It's businesses hearing from businesses about successes mm. and about resources that can really help them. So I think that that is an, another real tool and an encouraging that. And again, coming back to my point about the persistence, that this isn't just one task and we tick it, it's done. It's something that we have to keep on consistently on the agenda and adapt and, and take that message 
on and ensure that it's reflective of the current dynamic and exciting opportunities that we have in place as well. Thank you, Christina. Vanessa, final. Yes, Chris, I think that we indeed need to change perceptions, but we also need to change the reality and the reality uh, there's some very relevant pending issues in Latin America that we're taking uh, care of, of course, uh, domestically. But the more, I think I would go back to your story and go back to, to the, the assessment uh, you, you and Anar made, Chris, which is the more knowledge we have, the more contacts we have, and the stronger the relationship is, the more, I mean, the fair the, the, the information and the assessment on issues such as violence or corruption would be, it would be fairer and not with the noise of perhaps some part of the media. And on the other hand, it would also give some more peace and more predictability to Latin American relationship to the Brexit, for example. No, So you would take out the noise sometimes of, of the, these very, um, you know, a, a harsh media that is not necessarily uh, true to what the, the circumstances are. But, but again, I, I would go back to the study Then we need to enhance knowledge, we need to enhance contacts, and we need to, to build a relationship with trust. And when there's a relationship and where there's trust, then you get a, the right information so you can digest it and, and make you know, clever decisions that, that uh, uh, you know, uh, lead, to the, the, lead to more, more businesses and lead to more employment and lead to more prosperity, both for, for the UK citizens and for Latin American citizens. Thank you. Um, thank you both very much for uh, this incredibly constructive, uh, yes, positive, but honest uh, discussion and, and the numbers and facts and granular analysis you provided, very much welcome. And as I said at the beginning, we, we undertook this study not, not to criticize, uh, but to play a constructive role. Because I think we all are here and we had 70 people on the call because we care about the region. We care about deepening those relations, not just for Latin America and, and the UK, but also for geopolitics more broadly. And so I appreciate uh, all of your participation who, who are in on the call, Christina Irving Turner, Vanessa Rubio, and of course, the minister who had to leave. I really appreciate your time, uh, your thoughts, your reflections on this. So uh, please, Join me in thanking them and uh, go forth and let's deepen those trade relations. Count on us uh, to collaborate on this. Thank you very much, everyone.